We're good. Good to go? Good to go, Alana, ready to go. Okay. Hello, everyone. Before we begin, I'd like to seek a motion for approval of the minutes from our last meeting in May. Could I get a second? Second. second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you. So moved. Tonight, we'll cover our approach to keeping our school safe, as well as how our kids are wrapping up their school year, and a little news from the PTA. If you have questions for any of our speakers, please put them in the chat. First, from the Bronxville Police Department, we're so lucky to have Chief Christopher Satrielli. Chief, I know a lot of our questions were answered in the letter today in my hometown, Bronxville, from you and the mayor and others, but we're very grateful that you're here in person to address parents as well. Turning it over to you. Sure, good evening and thanks for having me back again. I, I didn't think I'd be back so soon after we met a few months back on our, our stranger um, incident within the village, but events throughout the country necessitated me um, coming tonight and speaking with you. Um, our column from the mayor and, and board and myself was timely. We felt it was uh, proper to describe our practices and our policies when it comes down to school events, school violence and school shootings. I know there's a lot of questions. I know there's a lot of press reports that are inaccurate. I, I urge people to um, wait until we get all the facts from Uvalde, but I will speak briefly about, about what we do here. I have found, believe it or not, that there are people that don't know me. So a uh, short introduction, I'm Christopher Satrielli. Started my career in Bronxville at 19 years old in the police academy. I've been here 36 years. I've been chief for 14 years. Um, Uvalde, Texas provided a unique set of facts and circumstances for that shooting. They have a what's called a school police department. It would be the equivalent of Vic or Roy being a sworn police officer and being the chief of police and all your guards being police officers. And then my department supplementing that school police department. Does exist in New York, it exists in some universities, SUNY, the SUNY police uh, patrol uh, SUNY campuses, but public schools are patrolled uh, by municipal police departments in Westchester County. So some of the reporting that's accurate is that the school police were in charge of the scene and making tactical, tactical decisions that maybe the sheriff there didn't agree with. Um, and we received a lot of emails and a lot of calls, a lot of inquiries about what would happen if we went to the school and somebody didn't agree with our tactics. Well, that wouldn't happen here. We are in charge in a critical incident. We are in charge we're talking about active shooters, so we're in charge in the shooter scenario, and uh, my officers follow my commands. I will be in constant communication with Roy and his team and Vic and his team about what we're doing, but my commands and my team's commands, um, we have jurisdiction over commanding that scene. So as the column laid out, the, the, other, the other part of this Texas incident that's getting a lot of attention is whether or not there was a delay and whether or not the officers waited outside um, while shots were being fired. And there was apparently a one hour delay or not a delay, but the SWAT team was one hour away. Um, a lot of the questions we received this week were about that topic and that subject. And I can tell you, we haven't confirmed yet, and eventually I will get confidential reports and information from the after action reviews. We don't know whether there was a delay. We know what tactics were there. I'm only gonna to speak to our tactics here. If we have an active shooter within Bronxville School, my team is trained to immediately respond to the threat and neutralize that threat without delay. What that means is you go towards the shots and you neutralize the shooter. 
What that means is you shoot back. That will occur within minutes. There will be no delay. There will be no waiting for better equipped officers. There will be no, no, no waiting for an emergency response team. Um, our officers are trained to respond recognize and neutralize the threat, whatever that entails. At, take a, take a, a, today, for example, my staffing was two police officers working with a sergeant on the desk. Since Uvalde, we dedicated one officer to the school. It's been an SRO, school resource officer, because we've had a, a two trained SROs on the day tour for this period of time. So we took one officer off the road and put him in the, uh, in the school. And we will do that till next Friday when school's over. If there were a shooter within the building, that SRO within the building is equipped with a bulletproof vest, doesn't have a plate carrier for, to, to protect against rifle, that's in the car, and a handgun with 15 rounds of ammunition and 30 extra rounds on his or her belt. That SRO would call in the active shooter and immediately run towards the gunshots and engage the shooter. What that does is our training and experience in these cases have shown that once the shooter is distracted, his attention or will turn, I say his, because in all these cases, it's been a male, his attention is turned towards the police officer. And in 90% of the cases, they commit suicide. And in the other 10%, it's either shot by a police officer or surrender. So the quicker we can engage a suspect, the more lives we can save. And we turn his attention towards us. In Texas, it is true that he barricaded himself within the classroom. We are, we learn, my team learns from all these incidents. And one of the things we learned from Texas, and I can confirm this, is that the first responding officers didn't have the necessary breaching tools to open that door and to get inside. And they needed to wait for more equipment. So we already have ordered equipment for our police cars and we will be, begin training in July for breaching of doors with all our officers. So that SRO will have the equipment necessary to breach a door if he or she is working alone. And they will be working alone, take today's scenario, for a short period of time. I'm across the street with the lieutenant and a detective sergeant and the other car was on the road. So within minutes, there'll be four more officers, myself included, to assist that initial responder. And if there's no SRO in the school, it's a one square mile village, we're within a minute or two of, of responding. So there'll be four officers while we await for East Chester or Tuckahoe uh, mutual aid response to come and assist us. These incidents are not protracted incidents when you confront the shooter. They don't last very long. Once confronted, as I said, it's either suicide, suicide by cop or surrender. So there's, there's really no need to sit outside and wait when you know that this is gonna result in likely a, a one of those three scenarios. We mentioned in the article, the Yonkers Police Department. The Yonkers Police Department is a tremendous uh, friend of our, of our police department. They're a tremendous resource. They have the most highly trained and equipped emergency response teams in the county. And they're out 24 hours a day in three separate trucks. And they will empty the city to come and help us if we need help. So our response to the school is immediate. Our response to a shooter is immediate and my team is charged with neutralizing that threat without delay. So I believe that answers most of the questions that are received in emails as far as what do you do if the shooter's in the building? What are we equipped with? What are our SROs doing? We will take this summer, July and August to sit down with Roy and his team and talk about how we staff the school in September. Uh, we've been doing park and walks in the school for years. COVID interrupted a lot of what we did. We plan on getting back to, at a minimum, the park and walks, which is police officers encouraged to park for an hour and walk through the building, have lunch with the kids, play basketball with the kids. At a minimum, um, I expect to have that return in September. 
I would like to return in September to what we're doing now, where there's somebody assigned full time to all three schools and they roam throughout the schools and and interact with the kids, interact with the staff. It puts a car out front. Um, it's a, it's a built in deterrent to anyone who might be wanting to come and uh, commit a crime or do something within the building. So we'll have summer discussions um, with Roy's team and the staff. And we'll be ready in September to go. Um, this is something we trained for for many years, at least the 14 years I'm here, we've been training for it. And uh, we hope it never happens. But if it does, we're confident that we can end the threat and end the shooting and save lives within within minutes. Chief, we have a few questions in the chat. Can I can I give them to you? Sure, go ahead. What is your recommendation regarding providing access to the building to visitors, non-students, non-administration, non-faculty? My recommendation is a closed campus and I've been recommending that for 15 years and I understand the resistance to that. I get it. I, I, have, I have three boys that went through a public school system that had an open campus. I see what I see the excitement and the enjoyment that the, the kids get out of leaving campus. But if you want to talk from a security standpoint, how can we get as close to 100% safe as possible? It would be a closed campus. But I'm realistic in knowing that that's likely not going to happen. So what I, will, what I will request and continue to request is tighten up the entry points. Uh, we, we all get laxed. We all get complacent. Uh, we can't afford complacency within the school building, especially when you have a K through 12 campus. That's a, it's a tremendous campus to police and to, to secure. Um, I don't believe visitors should be permitted within the building. I think the building is for the kids. The building is for the staff. The staff will feel a lot more safe if you don't have visitors and it'll be easier to point out a stranger or somebody doesn't belong. So I, I know there's a happy middle ground. Um, the school does a tremendous job with security, come a long way from when I started between, you know, you talk cameras and card access and monitors. Um, I was laughed at 25 years ago when I, when I said, let's put cameras in. Uh, now they want more cameras in the village. They want more cameras in the school. So We'll meet over the summer and, and I'll make my recommendations with full understanding that I know it's not gonna be a closed campus, but I think we can tighten some things up to make it easier for Roy's team to uh, keep the building safe. Thank you for your transparency about that. Does it make sense to have the new breaching equipment you're ordering securely stored on site within the school building? I met on uh, Monday night with the entire village board, the mayor and village administrator and the village attorney to discuss school safety as I'm doing now. One of my trustees recommended that and, and wonder if that was, was feasible. And that'll be one of the first things I talked to Roy about. What we'd like to do, we had an office for the SRO slash YO is youth officer. They're not trained to a level of a, of a school resource officer, but we put them in the building. We'd like to get an office back and if practic practicable, it would be um, advisable to put some breaching tools and the plate carrier within that room um, so that my SRO or youth officer in the building can protect himself or herself a little better and will have a better opportunity without delay to uh, breach a door uh, or, or enter a room with the required tools. So it's on my list. It's an excellent question. And I'm sure we could work something out. I would like, you know, maybe one set in each of the three buildings. And it's not, not going to be an ax hanging off the wall. Be very discreet um, and secure, but it'll be an opportunity for us to grab and go as we come in. Thank you so much. Uh, I can't tell you how much we appreciate you in general and, and having you join us tonight. So. Um, especially when you had another commitment. So I hope you can get back to where you were and we're very grateful. 
I, I, I will. And any questions, feel free to send an email or, or give me a phone call. We're, we're always available to answer questions on security. And if you have any recommendations um, for improvements or enhancements, send them my way. And, and uh, Roy's team and my team will discuss them and implement any of those that enhance safety. That's our, our number one goal. Thanks, Chris. Will do. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Um, guys, the flow of our meeting is a little off tonight because normally I would have started by saying a few thank yous and passing the baton to our next chair, but we wanted to work around the chief's availability. So if you'll let me, I'm going to take a minute now. I promise to be real quick. This experience of being chair was so rewarding because of all of you, like the faces I see in the Zoom boxes and the names I see there. Parents in our community are dynamic and engaged. They show up and work hard. They have great ideas and opinions and criticisms too, which are welcome. Um, it was a privilege to collaborate with all of you, whether you were a class parent, a grade chair, someone who ran a committee, whether you signed up for a shift at the Cupcake Cafe or you ran a huge event or you hosted a social, I'm so grateful to all of you. At the beginning of the year, our PTA president, Jen Heathwood, who's here tonight, shared that one of her goals was to bring the community back together after the past two years of COVID. And that really resonated with me. I hope you feel we managed to do that in new ways and with the return of some old traditions. Megan Paisley was our council secretary and Shelly Closa was our very hardworking treasurer. Thank you so much to both of you. Ms. Adams and Dr. Vistola are constant sources of support for the PTA. Thank you both so much. Dr. Montesano for always showing up at our meetings and all your leadership and guidance. Thank you. And last but not least, Mr. Joe Mercora. It was such a pleasure to play even a small part in your first year in Bronxville and witness all the positive energy and fresh perspective that you brought to the school. Thank you for everything. Um, and now I leave you in the very capable hands of our new chair who cares so much about making the school the best it can be. We're so lucky to have her take on this role, Tara Hansen. Thank you, Alana. Um, before we get back to discussing school safety and security, um, I just wanted to take a moment to say it's been so wonderful working with you this year. Um, you've dedicated so much of your time to making this year the absolute best possible for the children and families of the Bronxville Elementary School. Um, Alana has been a great leader, a great friend. Um, thankfully, she's not going far. Um, she's going to be helping next year with the PTA teacher appreciation efforts, um, amongst other things. So thank you. Um, now I will turn it to the attention of the meeting back to the security update. Um, understandably, many of you have expressed concern for your children after the events of the past month, and we wanted to highlight the plans that the district, in addition to what we've heard from the police department, has in place for the health and safety of our staff and students. Next on the agenda is hearing from our superintendent, Dr. Montesano, and our director of security, Mr. Victor Prenny. Um, sadly, this is Dr. Montesano's last, last elementary school council meeting, and we thank him for addressing such an important topic and for making himself available as always. Mr. Penny was hired a few years ago and has put into place some important changes, which I have asked them to highlight. Thank you for joining us, and I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Montesano. Thank you. Does this mean I'm not invited back in September? Because I'm not leaving till December. No, no, I said last, last meeting. Oh, last, last. Got it. I didn't get the second last, but gotcha. <laughs> uh, Alana, first, before I get into this, I want to say thank you to you for everything you do for the elementary school and for the PTA and for our staff. And you've really done a, a wonderful job uh, with us this year. I appreciate all your efforts and your positive energy. That's always there for us. Um, we very much appreciate it. Thank you for your leadership as well. Um, we, I'll provide a small update later on about other things, but since we're on the topic of safety and security, uh, what I thought I'd do is I'm gonna share my screen, if you don't mind, I have some slides that um, I'll start and Mr. Prenny, who is our director of security is gonna chime in as well as needed. So Vic, whenever you feel like uh, you wanna say something, please just pipe up. 
Um, Victor is a retired detective, is that right? Detective Sergeant, yes. Detective Sergeant, excuse me. From the uh, so he does a great background in law enforcement uh, and is well-trained in, in school security and in safety as well. Uh, so we'll get into that. So let me just share my screen if you don't mind, please. And um, let's see if we do this. Uh, okay, you can all see that I assume. Okay, so what I thought we would do if I can, here we go. So before I get into the slides, I just wanna emphasize what the chief said, and that is the cooperation that occurs between the Bronxville Police Department and the school district. We have a, a great respect, mutual respect for one another. Chris has been great in sharing resources with us, thoughts with us. Um, we're just so fortunate in our community to have someone who cares so much about the school and the community as, as the chief and the, and the entire uh, Bronxville PD, they are really partners with us. And I can't tell you how nice it makes us all feel that they're really literally uh, catty corner to us and can probably run to our school faster than they can drive. But it's been a great partnership. So tonight, um, just in talking about our plans and in, in the whole area of school security, um, there's some focus areas. First is on prevention and then some response and then our practice. So when we talk about prevention in school security, we look at our community, uh, the connections we have, the partnerships we have, the climate of the school, how inclusive we are with all our kids. Uh, because one thing that there was some similarities in, in many of the school shootings is that they are uh, done with the, a lot of times students or young adults who just are not connected, don't have a lot of, um, oops, sorry, assets uh, to their name. And it's something we feel really good about because because we're so small and because we have a good team in place, we feel we really know our kids. Uh, but the more awareness we can provide, the better off we are uh, so that we continue to focus on that. Uh, we have a continuous monitoring and assessment uh, program in place where we're constantly evaluating our children uh, through our teachers, through our, our psychologists, et cetera, uh, to make sure we're on top of um, any, any student who might feel disengaged at all. We focus on our physical deterrence, which we'll get into in a little while, what we've done with our building to try to make it as secure as possible. And of course, we are trying to increase ways uh, uh, for mental health awareness with our students and with our staff and we'll be continuing to develop that as one of our main goals for next year. Our response, we have great partnerships, as I mentioned, with the, with the Bronxville PD, Eastchester Fire Department, and uh, a, a, a security firm by the name of Alteris. Alteris is um, a firm that many schools in our areas do use for, um, for security oversight, if you will. Uh, that's where we hire Vic as our director of security from directly from Alteris. They're well-trained former law enforcement people who always provide us with a debriefing whenever uh, an incident of any kind occurs anywhere, uh, such as a school shooting. They are constantly helping us with our emergency response plan, um, provide us a lot of back-end office stuff and a lot of research that without them, we would be um, not as um, equipped to handle things as I feel we are. We do a lot of planning and we do a lot of training. <clears throat> uh, our practice, and we have a lot of drills that are required now by the state. We do above and beyond that. We have our lockdown drills. We have our shelter in place drills. We do fire drills. And we've also practiced in the past uh, reunification drills, meaning that if something were happening in the building where we had to have children off site and reunify, can't reunify them with parents, we've practiced that. Uh, we are going to practice it again, and we have a plan in place for that. <laughs> and we do a number of tabletop exercises, not only in-house, but also with cooperation of police department. So when we talk about prevention, we continuously review our emergency plans and protocols. Anytime we do a drill, there's a debriefing. We talk about it, what goes well, what doesn't go well. Anytime there's a, um, uh, an event anywhere across the country that involves schools, we get a debriefing from Alteris. We look at it together and see if we can improve our, our practice at all. We do have a district health and safety committee in place with monthly meetings, and that <clears throat> consists of staff members, administrators, teachers, uh, law enforcement, our director of security, 
uh, our nursing staff, uh, who all get together to uh, talk about these topics. We do annual training for our district emergency response team, um, including threat assessment, uh, which we just completed this year. And we have a comprehensive, which is also state required emergency response plan uh, in place as well. That'd be state approved. And as I mentioned, we're going to look at increasing our mental health awareness as well, because we think that's combined with everything on the prevention side and all the other things we have in place, that is key to making, uh, making our building as safe as we can. So re regarding physical deterrence, we do have guards at our three main entrances at the elementary, middle and high school entrances. We do have visitor protocols in place. Um, <clears throat> You know, it's, a lot has changed certainly in the last few years and certainly since I've been in, in the uh, district regarding visitors before parents were in the building a lot, visitors were in the building a lot, there was no real check-in system. Now we have specific protocols in place. We ask um, that when parents are coming in that there's an appointment made, that the guards know that the, important, the appointment is in place and we, we have people sign in have a badge, et cetera. So we try to, uh, to monitor that very, very closely. We have done some facility upgrades that include now what is called a man trap, excuse the gender reference, but a man trap at the elementary and high school areas, which means that there are two sets of doors. You can't get in, the, get in one set of doors. You can't get in the second and a set of doors unless the guard uh, buzzes you in in both places. We have the security booth and window at the elementary entrance as well. So no one has to come in that first entrance to speak to a guard. We do have a, a significant camera system in place inside our building and outside the school facility on our grounds. Those cameras are monitored all day throughout the day by uh, Vic uh, and, and the guards as well. And we do have uh, ID badges for our students and staff. Staff can buzz in to, to open the door. Uh, as I mentioned, partnerships with the, with the Bronxville PD, we're in constant communication with the chief and his staff. We do coordinated practice and training sessions. So when we do have lockdown drills, the police are there monitoring it uh, to give us feedback. We do a tabletop exercise at the end of it to review and see how it went. Um, the police do have access to our school cameras and that's increasing. Uh, we're putting some upgrades in over, over the summer to increase that access. Um, as the chief mentioned, we ha have had an office in place for the Bronxville PD to share when they come in. This started a conversation with myself and, and Chief Satriali about trying to get police to walk through our buildings during the day when they have, they have a shift, park the car, walk through, let people see you, talk to the kids, if you have paperwork, rather than do it in the car, come into our school, do it in the office. So there's a presence there. We've had police officers go to the cafeteria, have lunch with our kids, get to know them a little bit. And there's that sense of security when, you know, they're in our hallways and they're talking to us and, and um, they're seen as partners. And we have a shared radio communication system with the police as well. With Alteris, they uh, provide a comprehensive review of our district safety, security, emergency management plans. When we first uh, contracted with them, they did a full assessment our, of our physical plant, uh, made a, a number of recommendations of how to better secure our plant, uh, and we've implemented many of them. We have included the full-time director of security in the last few years. Uh, we do full debriefings of any major school security incidents that occur, and we do provide training for our in-house security guards on a constant basis. Some of our kind of ongoing improvements, if you will, um, we put in a new and updated and coordinated PA system. So now any staff member can call a lockdown uh, using a code in the phone system that's coordinated with the PA system. So, it, you know, our, our building is very large, a lot of windows, a lot of things. So if a staff member happens to see something happening outside, they can call a lockdown from their room from the phone. The guards uh, all have panic buttons at each of their stations which when pushed would uh, go right to the police station. And we're the summer, we hope to coordinate that with our PA system as well. So it, it signals an automatic lockdown. We do have two floating guards that monitor the outside areas, one in the back by the fields all the time, another that walks around the entrance, particularly in the front of our building when we have uh, students out there 
for recess or, or any other thing like that. So there are two outside the building as well. Uh, we do uh, update our plans annually. We also have an anonymous alert system in place on our website. So if anybody wants to report something uh, anonymously, concerned about a student, concerned about a family, concerned about something that they want to report to us, there is that anonymous alert system in place and we get it uh, automatically sent to us. And then we are allowed to follow up on that from there. And we do focus on opportunities to connect students, uh, increase our mental health awareness and, and try to make sure that we have students who are engaged, uh, engaged with us. So let me stop there for a second. Uh, and Vic, you know, if you want to take over anything and, and talk about anything, please do so. Sure. I just want to kind of introduce myself a little bit. Not too many people know me. My name is Victor Prenning. Uh, I'm a retired uh, law enforcement officer. I did 24 years in law enforcement. Uh, 11 years of that was pretty much working on major case investigations. I worked uh, just next door in the city of Yonkers. I know the city of Yonkers and the police department well. And I also know uh, Chief Satriel and a couple of the, uh, couple of the police officers and lieutenant from uh, Bronxville prior to coming to the school. Uh, as Roy mentioned, I do work for Alteris. Just want to give you a brief overview of Alteris. Alteris, uh, it's a consulting group made up of former law enforcement officers. Uh, it's been in business since 2008 for 14 years now. The primary focus is school safety. Uh, we work with over 50 school districts throughout New York and tri-state area, including some out of, in, in as, far as, as far as Louisiana. Uh, the benefit of having this access to this information, it's that uh, most of the time that there's anything that we can learn from these other districts, we try to bring it to the districts we work with. Whatever improvements, whatever works, whatever doesn't work, we try to improve, bring it to the district so we can improve the security with, with the schools we, we're working with. Um, let me just make sure I don't miss anything. Our consultants who work with us for the, for the uh, Alteris, every time there's a major incident, even the ones that are not publicized, the minors, some of the smaller incidents, they review these incidents and try to learn from them. We try to see what's the best practice that we can implement to the schools and the, and the, and the district we can work with. Um, That's as far as uh, Alteris, that's uh, what we uh, bring to the table. Um, and like Roy said, we do uh, manage the school's uh, emergency plans. We update it and make sure it's in compliance with the state laws and, and, uh, and they have to be submitted every year to uh, maintain, our, uh, maintain our school emergency plans. Uh, as far as the school, school is concerned, we have 109 cameras, like what I mentioned before. We, uh, that we use to monitor our access entrances, access points. And the security guards also have access to the cameras and they watch all the doors in the area. Our concern is we wanna make sure all the doors remain locked at all times. And our, and our biggest concern is that we have someone come to the school that doesn't belong there. We also uh, encourage our faculty and staff to be security conscious. We want our faculty and staff, like Roy mentioned, we, we asked them that they get involved. They, if they see someone in the hallway, challenge them, ask them, who are you? What are you doing here? If there's anything, any, if they encounter any kind of threat, imminent threat, place the school in the lockdown. Let's be safe. And whatever the, the incident may be, whatever that person may be, we'll deal with it. But the main goal is to keep our students and our faculty and staff safe. Uh, let's see what we have here. We also, as Roy mentioned before, we have nine security guards. We cover all the entrances and they are very good when dealing with students. They know a lot of the students. They know a lot of the parents. They see the parents and see the students every day. They kind of have an idea who belongs, who should be coming to the school, who should be approaching the school. And a lot of times I get those calls and listen, we got a guy outside doesn't seem right. And I'll go out there and if necessary, I'll bring the police department involved and we find who it is and what their business is being on school grounds or on, around the school. But that's, uh, let me see what else we have here. I think Roy pretty much covered most of it. We do our drills. We may make, we do our lockdown drills, fire drills. And, and every time we do the drills, we evaluate just how well we did. We walk around, we make sure everybody's following the, 
the security procedure we have in place uh, just to make sure that we're, we're on top of it. Uh, that's about it. If there's any questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, thanks, Vic. One of the things I just wanted to, to mention to everyone, um, you know, as you know, we are, it's a very small and very tight community. And, uh, you know, our challenge is to try to secure our building whilst not shutting off our building at the same time. And that's, you know, it is challenging for us because we do have an open campus. We do have our kids who go up to town and have lunch. We have our kids outside for recess uh, and for instruction. And we want to encourage that and continue that because that's what makes our school so inviting and welcoming and everything else. But we try to balance that with, um, with the need for security. And I think we do a pretty good job of that with our floating guards and everything else. Um, if there ever is a lockdown and kids are outside, there is a blue flashing light that goes off as well to signal the staff that, um, that something's going on and to get away from the building. So that is in place as well. But we're continuing, uh, continuing to evaluate all those things. And again, trying to balance the need for our neighborhood welcoming positive school uh, and making it secure as well. Um, so I don't know if there's any questions on security. We'll be happy to entertain those. If not, I'll just give another quick update, a couple of things, if that's fine. It uh, doesn't look like any questions, just um, a lot of thanks. Okay, terrific. Uh, okay, thanks. And just uh, uh, moving along, thanks, Vic. Um, as you know, June for us is a sprint. A lot of things that are going on uh, each and every night between awards and concerts and all those things. We uh, get to the finish line pretty quickly here. Uh, congratulations, Joe, on making it through your first year. Well done. <laughs> um, our last public board meeting is uh, next Thursday evening. And we do have three uh, board members going off the board uh, as their last meeting. Um, and they, they've been terrific. I wanna thank Arlene Thomas and Tom Curran and Jack Beerworth for their service on the board for the last six years. Um, they've been terrific board members and we welcome three new board members as well. So as you know, there's gonna be a transition going on as we welcome the three new board members in July and uh, they continue the search for a new superintendent as well. Um, no decisions will be made until after the new board is uh, seated. And I'm sure more information will come out at that point on the, uh, on the superintendent search. Um, so that's pretty much, I just wanna thank you all for um, everything you do for us and for, for the engagement we have with our parents. It's really nice to be so well supported. So thank you, Tara. Thank you both for highlighting the extensive plans that are in place to keep everyone safe. Um, we attach the current district safety and emergency management plan to the agenda. This can also be found on the Board of Education's website. Please take a look and don't hesitate to follow up with any additional questions. Next on the agenda is hearing from our principal, Mr. Joe McCora. He will be sharing year end highlights from the classroom. This month marks the end of the first year for Mr. McCora as our principal. It strikes me that this was not the easiest year to start as a new principal. Personally, I was impressed that in a year where we could not all physically be together until the last several weeks, Mr. McCora managed to learn just about every student and family in the school. Thank you, Mr. McCora, for your willingness to listen to parents and accommodate just as much as you could under challenging circumstances. Uh, thank you so much, Tara, and I, I just want to say thank you. It's actually my wife uh, pointed out to me that uh, tomorrow was actually marks one year that I was uh, given the wonderful honor of being appointed by our school board uh, as the principal. So it's one year tomorrow, and I, I say thank you so much to everyone for all of their support. And it continues and will be, to be an honor to work here in Bronxville with these great students and, and this great community and, and this great staff. So uh, just to give you a little bit of an update on things that have happening. First of all, I would be remiss if I did not first welcome Tara and truly looking forward to have worked with you this year and looking forward to working with you as the council chair. But I, I must give uh, an homage, of course, to uh, Alana. Uh, leadership to me has many definitions, but truly it is that art of motivating a group of people to act toward achieving a common goal. So on behalf of all of us, Alana, thank you so much for all you did for our elementary council and school. It was an honor to have you as our leader. And like Roy said best, we're not letting you go. We're just going to have you involved in a lot of other things now. So thank you. 
And Tara, thank you so much for taking this on. It's going to be great. So this report is going, and it is about a lot of end of year celebrations. And really it is going back to September and celebrating the resilience of our school and our, our, our resilience of our school and our community. Um, in kindergarten, the chicks have hatched and uh, I'm watching that. And we have right now going through our ABC countdown celebration where the children every year are celebrating a letter and something about that. For example, C, uh, is celebration and the themes that they're having. I want to thank us also our PTA for helping with the dyeing of our red, white, and blue t-shirts that were worn very proudly at the Memorial Day ceremony. First grade, they're wrapping up. I mentioned last month about narrative fiction stories. They're now sharing those stories and those unique characters that they developed. Studying geography with their mapping unit. Uh, they're diving into the study of nouns over the last few weeks. And this week, uh, this particular Pete the Cat World Tour came to uh, Bronxville Elementary School and our kindergarten first and second graders got to experience this amazing show. Uh, second grade, what makes me be, uh, what makes me become we? Social studies unit they're working on, it's about community and they're researching the challenges people face in meeting their needs and wants. And another exciting project they've been working on is a homemade game to review a second grade topic or skill that they've learned about. Third grade, I mentioned last month about symphony space. So they finished their studies of the cultures of Brazil and India. And right now they're learning about um, music and dance of the Iroquois and Plains Indians, uh, African dance with a focus on Mali, uh, different types of Latin jazz, folk dances in Mexico, classic Indian dance, music and myths, and taiko drums, koto, and flutes of Japan. And it's an incredible process to do this. And, doing a phenomenal job with it each and every day. Our fourth grade, get ready for the premiere. It's coming up in a couple of weeks where they will unveil their works and their videos of uh, don't wait to unmake the mediosphere. And it's basically an anti-bullying type of a project where students create positive media, speaking of kindness, respect, and being good to one another. And each fourth grade has worked on a unique assignment and we're gonna premiere them to their families in the coming weeks. Fifth grade, splashdown trip is coming up. Last night we celebrated with our fifth graders with a Basque fifth grade party. Uh, over 70 plus students attended. We're getting ready for our moving up rehearsals. And I mentioned this at our last month, but Be the Change are coming up and uh, taking place. The students are researching and making proposals for the project better their school and community. And we look forward to hearing what they have to say. And the picture that I've provided is uh, the Be the Change project today that was given for the fifth graders to our fourth graders, and it was an anti-bullying theme. On uh, Thursday, June 2nd, we played host to over 100 parents of our incoming kindergarten class, and many thanks to the PTA for all of their assistance. It was an in-person welcome. And again, thank you to our PTA and families for all of their hard work and support this entire school year. We could not have done it without you. We're a team working for the common goal of the success of our students. So thank you all so much for making my first year so special. And thank you for all of the hard work and dedication and support you give to our students every year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McCora. Um, next up, we have uh, Dr. Joyce Vestola. Um, the morning after the horrific school shooting in Uvalde, Texas, the first thing I, I thought of when I woke up was whether I should tell my children before they went to school. And even if I decided to tell them, how should I tell them? I didn't know where to start. We asked Dr. Vestola to join us this evening to help talk about such tra tragedies with children. Dr. Vestola is one of our school psychologists, and I'm sure all of you are aware is the director of the CARE program, which stands for Community Awareness, Responsibility, and Empathy. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Vestola. You're on mute. Some people would appreciate that. Um, uh, <laughs> thank you, Tara. Um, before I start on you know, this most important topic, I wanna give a shout out to Joe. 
there's not a day that goes by that Joe and I aren't constantly conferencing about all things elementary. And he's that principal. One of the joys of working in, a, in an elementary school, and Roy will tell you this because I'm always sending him videos and things that kids say, is to just be able to share you know, the exuberance and the vitality and the amazing things that kids come up with. Uh, and Joe's that person. I can just barge into his office. I knock first. I, you know, I've learned a thing or two and, and just share the delight and the challenges, obviously, of, of working with children. So it's been a great year, Joe. So thank you. Um, and in terms of Alana, oh my God, uh, the only thing that I feel good about is that you're here, Tara, and you and I and Alana have already met about improving communication and care, and that Alana is going to be working on teacher appreciation, which I will get to, you know, in a minute. Um, you know, the night before uh, the night before school started that day, the night you know that um, that we heard about the shooting, Rachel and I and the psychologist, Joe, we were all texting and emailing furiously to each other. And um, what we did was the morning of school that day, we all met as a crisis team. And what the psychologist did in concert with um, Rachel was to put together a list of talking points for teachers develop, uh, according to developmental levels. So th if, if the children came in and discussed what had happened the night before, they were ready. And Joe personally went to every single teacher to review that you know, as well surprisingly, and I'm saying this as a psychologist with years of experience, the topic was only brought up in two classes, one third grade class and one fourth grade class. And the teachers were ready and prepared, you know, and equipped. So I feel that teachers and parents, I mean, really deserve a pat on the back for being ready, for being prepared for, to a certain extent, I would say shielding your children from uh, the news and social media and shielding them from your personal horror about what occurred. I think that teachers and parents, I think that we feel more horror and, and me sometimes despair actually about the events that have taken care of, uh, you know, that have occurred in schools. I think for, to a certain extent, I think our children um, feel, you know, a certain magical thinking, a certain invulnerability, and they feel safe in our school. And that's pretty evident. So not a lot of discussion occurred. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Joe, but I didn't hear anything um, since that day about things coming up in the classroom. No, the, the theme of that day was to keep it as normal as possible for the kids, arm the teachers with the great resources that they had. And, that, and Dr. Vistola was wonderful about making her rounds uh, to every classroom to just check in and make sure, along with uh, our other two school psychologists, Dr. Lewis and Mr. Kelly. And um, it went pretty seamless that day, right, Joyce? I think it really went well. And the parents, again, kudos to the parents for all they did at home and having whatever conversations they felt appropriate. And I think when whatever questions, few questions did come up, they were answered in an age appropriate manner. So kudos to everybody and thank you to Joyce as well. I will get back uh, to how we can handle these very frightening topics with our children. But I, I wanna say first that I want you, I just want you to know that these events impact our teachers tremendously. I mean, they went into the classroom, 
the heroes that they are, but underneath, your teachers feel a tremendous responsibility for your children. The first and the foremost thing that they know from day one is they are the responsible for the safety of your children. And they take it very, very seriously. So to bear witness to what happened in Texas, particularly with elementary school teachers, was very, very upsetting to them. And we provided, um, you know, some coffee and just, you know, opportunities for them to talk. But I, I want you to know that if you have a chance, you know, and um, it's really important to let the teachers know how much you appreciate and, and value them. They are always looking out for your children's safety, not only physically, but emotionally. And um, one of the things that I've been doing in my end of the year care classes is as the children are talking about what, um, what they're going to miss, what they're looking forward to, they invariably come up with, you know, say they're going to miss their teacher. And what I've done in every class is have the kids make a list on, a, on an easel what they're going to miss about their teacher. And Joe's seen those lists, they're enormous and they're heartwarming for the teachers. I would recommend to you that if there is something special that a teacher did or something that you noticed or something that your kids came home and talked about all the time, let that teacher know. Just like I said to the kids at the end of the class, some of the teachers were teary-eyed after this. Your words mean a great deal. Your te the, you know, the, your, the teachers say, my class, my kids. And it's tough for them at the end of the year to let them go as well. Um, they've developed such a, an intense relationship and community together. So I, I wanted to make that important point. How do we handle these scary topics with kids? We make space. We make space where they feel they can bring things up to you. Now, it's very likely, especially even with young children, if your younger kids, K-1-2, have an older sibling, it's very likely that they've heard it from an um older sibling or heard something or, you know, or heard the news in the distance. There's, a, there's, you know, your kids, I am not going to say you must bring it up, but the thinking in the field is it's better to bring it up at home, you know, developmentally than not because the things that they could hear from other kids on the playground and the elaborations that can occur can be more scary. By your bringing it up, on some level, you are communicating that it's okay to talk about these things. How do you bring it up? I'm wondering if you heard anything today in school about what had occurred in Texas. See if they heard anything. If they say no, you know, then say, well, you know, something really sad happened in Texas. You know, there was a school shooting and that's very far away. And then leave it. We don't let their questions be your guide. Don't, don't, you know, don't go on unless they ask questions. Uh, that will tell you how much they want to deal with it, how, you know, how they feel about it. Uh, let me just see. Um, that person is far away. It's very important to emphasize that the school is safe that we live in a safe community, emphasize that the police department is all across the street. And what I absolutely love that Chief has been doing is uh, Officer Cheryl, Officer David, Officer Nigel across the, you know, who's often um, in, across the street by the library. They walk through the school regularly. 
I had Officer Cheryl in a care class this week. She walked into the room, right? Any opportunity for learning, we go for it, right? She talked about how she helps people when they're upset and calm down. She talked about that she's the only, you know, we talked about, you know, uh, women on the police force. And that's a real positive, you know, for the kids feeling safe and that, you know, our police department is a part of our community. Um, so, I mean, that, I, you know, I welcome any questions. I, I do want to say as an aside, a couple of things. When I was in the middle school, frequently we, I was privy to problems that kids were having from other students and from other students' parents and from things that occurred on social media. And I, th I think as your kids get older, especially as they go to middle school, encourage them to let you know if someone seems inordinately upset. Um, I never, I would say to the kids, I will never reveal that you told me. However, I can't guarantee that the kid would find out because you know that, and, and I say the same thing to the parents. And I, oh, whenever a kid came to me worried about a friend, we always contacted you and we'd always you know, follow up with the student and the other parent. Um, our students are often our best source of information and they're empathic and it's frightening to them. Um, when other kids are very distressed and um, exhibit significant mental health issues. Finally, I, I want to say that one thing I did notice this year, and I've been struck by, is that a lot of kids have sleep problems. And what I love is that they talk about it. They feel safe to talk about it within the classroom. We just talked about it in a classroom today. And I mean, I could have gone on for an extra hour. Um, I, uh, we talked about skills you could use, but going forward, I, I want to develop more specific care lessons for sleep problems. Um, I want you to be able to talk to your kids about their, their sleep. Um, see, sleep hygiene is so important. And I, I'm, you know, I wanted to talk to you, Tara, and maybe be well about bringing in a speaker in the fall to talk about how to manage your children's sleep problems because they're frightened of so many things at night, which they rationally know is not real. But you know what it's like when the lights are out and the rooms are d dark. So that's one thing I want to focus on going forward. What I I do want to say is that first of all, I want to. I'm not a big Barry and Manilow fan, but looks like we made it. You know, we've been singing I'm Still Standing for two weeks now. They have done such a noble job. What we talked about these last two weeks is they're identifying all the things that they're proud of that they accomplished this year, not only in the classroom, it could be in sports, in music, with siblings, and to really feel that pride. And they've been able to identify that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's all I have to say. Thank you, as always, Dr. Vestola. Um, also attached to the agenda is a link from the Child Mind Institute about how to talk to kids about school shootings. One thing from the article that resonated for me was, and Dr. Vestola, you mentioned this, that kids actually feel less scared when we get to talk about scary things and how important it is to open up a dialogue for children with trusted adults. Uh, we're joined now by our outgoing PTA president, Jennifer Heathwood. I'd also like to thank Jen for leading the broader PTA this year and focusing on bringing our community together. Jen is staying on as chair of the Centennial Committee, and she is here to highlight a really exciting event happening this fall. Thank you, Alana and Tara. Um, congrats, Alana, on a great year. Welcome, Tara. I know you're going to be fabulous. You've already done so much for the PTA, so we're excited to have you in this role. 
Um, yeah, so I'm here to talk about our 100th anniversary. We are celebrating this fall. Homecoming weekend is the weekend of September 24th. And I wanted you to mark your calendars and set that aside for also the 100th anniversary celebration. I just wanna note that it is a long weekend because we have off on Monday and Tuesday. So before you decide to go out of town, think about being here and coming together as a community for homecoming weekend and for our 100th anniversary. Um, the PTA is working as part of a 100th anniversary committee that is headed by Dr. Montesano. It's a collaboration with the administration, the foundation, the village trustees, the historical society, and the Chamber of Commerce. So there are a lot of hands in making that weekend a really special celebration. And the main goal is to showcase our school and celebrate 100 years together. And part of showcase, I think the biggest part of showcasing our school is showcasing our students. So we're hoping that um, the work of the students will be a big part of the celebration. Um, <clears throat> both by including their, their work in the arts, um, visual arts and music, as far as the band and orchestra and chorus go. And then also the sports teams will be on display um, all throughout the week. And the football team will be playing on Saturday night, which is always just a really exciting night and an exciting way to come all be together. If you didn't go this year, I really suggest you come out there. Even young kids have a great time. The Bronco Barn is open and it's just such a, a, a fun and exciting night. Let's hope for good weather. <laughs> um, so some other things that we're working on are um, the foundation is, is also our connection with our alumni and, and we're hoping to have a panel of alumni talk of successful alumni here to have a discussion and talk. Um, we're going to, they're going to be heading up some school tours our, uh, from the PTA side, our fall socials, which we typically have, will be dedicated to the 100th anniversary and we'll have an additional social that will be for alumni and um, members of our village. So that's kind of a highlight. I hope you guys will put the weekend aside. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Uh, I appreciate everyone's time and attention tonight. Uh, this was uh, definitely a lot of heavy topics to cover for this first meeting with you all. Um, but we definitely thought it was probably the most uh, important subjects that we could cover at this time. I look forward to working with the parents who volunteered for the council next year. Uh, we have a lot of committees, a lot of work to do to keep our school a wonderful place for our children to go every day. If you haven't yet raised your hand to get involved and you're interested, please reach out and um, we'll definitely find something for you. Um, an email will go out at the end of August asking for volunteers for class parents. And thank you, have a great rest of the evening and happy summer. <laughs>